Our friends at Perla are big proponents of simple, long-term investing, and now they're rewarding you for being a long-term investor too. Perla investors receive points every time they fund their account and invest. The more points you earn, the higher your chances to win one of their weekly prizes or the big prize at the end of the month. To get started, check out the competition terms and conditions and open your Perla account today using the links in your podcast player. This episode of the Australian Finance Podcast is proudly supported by GlobalX ETFs and the launch of the US100 ETF, better known as N100. N100 offers Australian investors exposure to 100 of the largest non-financial companies listed on the NASDAQ Stock Exchange. N100 focuses on innovation-driven companies, providing a growth tilt to core portfolio holdings. You can learn more about N100, including reading the PDS and TMD by clicking the link in your podcast player or by simply heading to globalxetfs.com.au. Hey there, here's a quick note. This podcast contains general financial advice only. That means it's not specific to you, your needs, goals, or objectives. So don't act on the information until you've spoken with your financial advisor. You'll find our full disclosure, disclaimer, and link to our financial services guide in the show notes. David, welcome onto the Australian Finance Podcast today. Thanks, Kate. It's great to have you here in person. And today we're going to be talking about topics that everyone just loves to talk about, death and money. Well, we have to though, unfortunately. It's a fact of life, isn't it? Yeah. And this is one of your areas of expertise. Uh, Yes, I'm a um, senior advisor at State Trustees. So I do the uh, technical advice and support for everything deceased estate related. Yeah, and they are lawyers that you can access that's uh, funded by the government? Uh, We're a government business enterprise, um, so we're actually a company. Our shareholder is the treasurer of the state of Victoria, so we're a government-owned, yes. Yes. And effectively, people think of us as the public trustee. Okay, so if you wanted a will or someone to help manage your estate, uh, you could see state trustees? State trustees actually write more wills and administer more estates than any other organisation in Victoria by a long way. So the answer is yes, we write lots of wills and powers of attorney and we administer lots of estates. Yes. Yeah, so you have a lot of lawyers doing all of this. It's not just lawyers, yes, but we do have um, um, lawyers as well. Um, we have lots of different um, divisions. One of the things is we provide an end-to-end service. So we'll have um, people in tax and conveyancing and finance as well as lawyers and state administrators. Yeah, and we probably should mention at the start this is a Victorian body and is there one for every state? Every state has a public trustee but yes, um, state trustees operates in Victoria, yes. Yeah, and when we go through the conversation about wills and estates today, I know sometimes it can be state dependent, can it? Uh, yes, I mean um, unfortunately we don't have uniform laws as yet, um, hopefully that will come. Uh, In lots of areas, we're reasonably common, but yes, there are differences, probably mainly in in respect to things like claims on a state. So yes, it is um, state dependent. Okay. So maybe just keeping in mind, if any listeners are outside of Victoria, that things might be slightly different in your state. Correct. Yes. And maybe we'll try to point that out as we- Yeah. A lot of them will be basic concepts that we're talking about, but yes, there can be um, individual provisions to consider, yes. Awesome. Well, maybe we kick off the episode defining some of the key terms that are going to come up again and again throughout the conversation, just so everyone's got a base level of understanding. Because uh, I know most people, my friends and family included, don't like to talk about this topic. So um, it's it's hard to ask the questions and even know where to go. So do we want to start with potentially the term estate? What does that mean? Well, essentially estate is the assets and liabilities that exist at the time that you decease and the, so what you have to administer. I consider estate in that term. Okay. And if I know you mentioned that this was a good term to know about before, but testator? A testator is the person who writes the will. So when we talk about the person making the will, we talk about a testator. Essentially, there's a testator, male, testatrix, female, but often it's just testator to cover the field. Okay, cool. And what about beneficiary? Well, beneficiary is the uh, person or organisation who will be receiving a benefit from your will. Okay, because I think listeners might be familiar with that term because it's used in other areas of Correct. finance yeah, as it well. Is. It is. Yeah. Um, what about executor? Well, executor is the person who manages your estate or administrates your estate. So that's the person who has the responsibility to carry out the wishes that you've expressed in your will. 
Mm, and that's definitely one we're going to talk about a bit more in this yeah. episode because there's a bit to it. Yeah. What about intestate? Okay. If you die without a will or a valid will, you're said to have died intestate and as a result of which your estate will be distributed according to a statutory formula. Okay. So the goal of after listening to this episode, hopefully listeners don't fall into the um, trap of dying intestate because Correct. they get a will and get a valid will, more yeah. importantly. Correct, yes. Okay, what about probate? Well, we talk about getting a grant of probate, which is an order of the court through the Registrar of Probates, which officially proves the will and formally appoints the executor to act. So where you've got a will, it's a grant of probate. Where you don't have a will, you die intestate, we talk about a grant of letters of administration. Okay, so there's a few steps uh, after you die between um, having the will and distributing the money. Correct. Okay, we'll definitely dive into that a bit yeah. more as well. What about will itself? Okay, uh, well, a will is the written document that deals with um, your assets and, um, you know, it gives effect to your wishes. It's we, we, it's your voice. It's where you set mm -hmm. out what you want to have happen when you go. That's the document that sets it out. Awesome. And the final term I wanted to do, define, what about trustee? Okay. <clears throat> the executor is the person that basically who manages your estate. But if there are assets or funds that are to be held for some period of time thereafter into the future, they're held on trust and the person who manages those assets is your trustee. So uh, it's very common for the executor also to be the trustee. So executor does the immediate management of the estate. Once you get to a settled estate stage, you either distribute or place assets in trust and the trustee manages the ongoing trust. Mm, and you can use an external trustee like state trustees. To be executor or trustee. Okay. Either or both, one or the other, yep. Wonderful. Well, I guess the most important thing and the thing that people will be familiar with is the concept of a will and putting your last wishes down on yeah. a piece of paper. Um, it requires a little bit more than just writing that I want my dog to go to my sister on a napkin. Yeah. So what's required for a valid will? Not a lot, actually. It's got to be in writing. It's got to be signed. It's got to be witnessed by two people, two adult people who are present at the same time and made with the intention of being a will. But essentially, they're the rules. There's no format you've got to use. There's no heading or special words that you need to do. I mean, you have to be age 18 and a full capacity, mm -hmm. but otherwise, um, in writing, signed and witnessed, and that's sufficient for a valid will. It makes it sound quite simple. Uh, well... It, there are a lot of pitfalls and traps. If you know what you're doing, you're fine, um, which is why people need to um, consider getting advice because it's. I mean, we work hard to acquire our assets and it, I was amazed when people don't then want to protect and control what happens to them. So it's an area where you should go and get some advice. Yeah, and I know a lot of younger people often think they don't need to sort out getting a will into their 40s or 50s when they have assets but I think a lot of people in their 20s and 30s forget that they've actually got superannuation accumulating they've got money in their savings maybe they own a car so if you want to decide where all this money goes you need to start thinking about a will early on. I think any adult person should have a will because as you say I mean uh, you're working you've got um, superannuation which may or may not come to the estate it's also you don't quite know what you're going to have when you pass, I mean, we're all going to win Tats Lotto this weekend or um, you might get an inheritance, there might be, um, you know, those sorts of things. But even if you don't have significant assets, it still might be very important to you who you leave um, things to. So, yes, you should have it. But also importantly, you should also review from time to time um, your will. Okay, now... Reviewing it doesn't mean you've got to change it. It just means you've got to review it because your circumstances will change over time and, you know, not just, you know, each few years but certain life events, things like relationships is the big one. Mm. Um, if you start or end a permanent type relationship, whether that's a marriage or whether it's a domestic partnership, you'd need to consider those things. Having children obviously is a very big one for people, um, but also starting your employment life 
or ending it in retirement or things, but even things like travel and not, and, and the like. Mm. There's lots of events that occur where you really should sit down and think about, have I got a valid will which will deal with my assets if something was to happen to me? Yeah, and your situation can change very yes. quickly and so yeah. it's important to stay on top of this document. I don't know if anyone's ever asked this question, but do wills expire? No. No? No, they, they will continue to operate. Um, so um, we often are dealing with very, very old wills where someone has made a will and has just uh, continued to remain there. You can revoke wills, you can change wills, you can do all that sort of stuff. But um, if you make a will, it will continue. Yes, okay, that's good lifetime. to know. So yes. if you do your will and you're pretty happy with how everything's distributed and you have no major life events. Well, I, look, there's a qualification that I probably need <laughs> to make. There, are, there, there can be an episode that could bring a will to an end, one of which is if you marry. Mm. So let's just say that you've got a will and then 10 years later you marry, that um, uh, the will will be revoked. Okay. Okay, um, unless your will was made in contemplation of marriage. And one thing is, if, for argument's sake, um, you'd made gifts to a person that you marry, the gift that you made will still be respected. But, yeah, that's a circumstance where a will can be revoked. Interestingly enough, if you divorce, your will remains valid, but you consider the divorced spouse to have predeceased. You put a line through that person oh, really? and move on. That's by legislation. But yeah. otherwise, uh, your will will continue. It doesn't expire. And this just applies to marriage, not de facto? This Correct, specific. yes, marriage. Okay. Marriage evokes really. Marriage. Okay, so very specific <laughs> there. Um, and once you've got this document, where's a good place to store it? Because I know a lot of people in their 20s and 30s, they're travelling, they're moving around a lot and potentially they don't want to worry about this really important document moving house every couple of years. Well, um, not at home in the top uh, drawer of the filing cabinet um, because basically what you're concerned about is not just losing it and mislaying it when you, you, mm. you, when you move, but fire or theft, um, you'll lose it. If it's going to be stored at home, you'd want it to be in a safe, you know, I'm talking about a proper, secure safe, and also someone knowing that it's there and how to access it. <laughs> but really, you should be thinking about things like trustee companies or solicitors mm -hmm. who will generally hold um, wills or important documents without charge. Um, state trustees have a will bank. Mm -hmm. And actually, we encourage people to uh, lodge wills or powers of attorney. Um, free service, um, as we, in solicitors also will provide that sort of a service. Um, you don't have to have written a will with state trustees or have us as executor. Okay. It's more just having a place because part of our mandate is public benefit and we want to get the message out. People should have wills and they should store it safely so we try and give effect to that. Okay, so you've got a big warehouse somewhere in Victoria yes, that's housing yes, like millions yes, of yes, different wills. Yes, yes. Oh, yes, wow. That's, yeah. that's a cool service to know about. So yeah. any yeah. listeners, free service to yeah. store your will. Yes. I guess you've just got to tell one other person probably where you're storing the will. Very important for somebody to know um, where your will is because you're the only person who doesn't have to know because yeah. you won't be here. <laughs> um, but, yeah, no, that it, you know, in all seriousness, it actually is very important for people to know where it is because um, one of the first task is identify did the person have a will and where is it and that can be quite difficult if you don't know and you've got to do things like searching the premises mm. inquiring of banks looking at uh, did they ever use a solicitor for conveyancing or family law or something and inquiring for them or local lawyers asking mm. friends and family even if you get a document and it's old is that the latest document that's why people really do need to know otherwise you can either waste time, effort, trouble and money trying to locate it or you can start acting on a document and find, oh, no, no, there's another document oh, wow. and yep. that, could, that could have quite serious consequences. So, yeah, it's important people know where your will is. Yeah, and I think that comes back to just making the process as easy as possible for your loved ones in the event that you do pass because we don't like to think about that event. But if yeah. you can forward think a little bit, you can make everyone's life a little bit easier at Absolutely. that time. yes. And if we start digging in a bit deeper about how do we actually put this will together, what are some of the things you need to think about if you're saying, okay, in a couple of months' time, I've got an appointment book with a solicitor yes. to put together my will, but I don't even, like, I've got to think about what I want to leave to who. Where do we start here? Well, first thing is, what have you got? 
then you're going to say, um, who do you want to receive it? Mm-hmm. Who do you want to manage or administer your estate? And what are your wishes? So if we sort of look at that in a little bit more detail, in terms of understanding your assets, you need to have an understanding as to what you own and what can be dealt with as part of your estate. There are differences, for instance, between a property which is held jointly and a property which is held as tenants in common. Very different consequences. You really need to understand that. You need to understand with superannuation, is that likely to come to the estate or not? So understanding what you've got is the first thing. Then, of course, you've got to think about um, who you want to receive and how you want them to receive it because there's different things that you can do. Things like there can be a gift of money, a legacy, or a gift of items. The main thing is to have a proper remainder clause. In other words, and I give the balance of all of my assets to whoever you want them to go to. And very important is to make sure that there is a gift over clause, an effective gift over clause. So I give everything I own to Kate, but if something happens to Kate, then I will give it to all of her children or the lost dog's home or whatever it might be, but at least having thought about it. So you've got to think about who you want, how they want it, and then options. And then, of course, very important to determine who do you want to manage your estate. Now, it's got to be someone who's ready, willing and able to do it. So they've got to want to do it, they've got to be available to do it, and they've got to be skilled to do it. So give some thought to that. Yep. And the other thing is wishes. Because a will is a place that you can express wishes. Don't have to, it's not compulsory, but if you want to, it's a good place to put your funeral wishes. What do I want to have happen to my body? Do I want to be cremated or buried or a service? Um, what about if I'm a, a younger person with um, minor children? Who do I want to be the guardian of my children? Um, a very common one is pets. You know, very pets are very important to people. You know, who do I want to look after them or do I want to give someone a gift so that they can look after them and it's not going to cost them money or animal bequest programs through charities and the like. So um, what have you got? Who do you want to have it? Who's going to administer? And wishes are the things that get you to think about before you come in to see a trustee company or a solicitor. And how specific can you be with gifts and leaving money to people? Could you say, I want to leave my wedding ring to this daughter, I want to leave my engagement ring to this daughter? Absolutely, yes, and people do. I mean, that's that's not uncommon. Okay. Uh, with legacies, when you're leaving money, you might want to think about inflation over time. If I've got a, you know, I often see a, a will from, you know, 1960, you know, I give $1,000 <laughs> to somebody <laughs> thinking this is going to uh, last yeah, them a them lifetime. Life. Yeah, but uh, a way you can overcome it is to say, I give an amount of money and then, um, uh, you know, have an, an interest provision, so an index interest provision so okay. that it, it, it keeps yeah, you know, current those sorts of things you can do, but you can be very, very creative when you when you do wills, and it's one of the reasons you do wills, <laughs> so that you you know because it might be individuals who are not family that you want to benefit. You might want charities to benefit. Yeah. these are the things that you can do. Also, you establish trusts. Um, you know, not everyone is going to get something. You, you don't necessarily want them to get it. Absolutely, you might want to impose conditions. So, um, if you've got a will, those are the sorts of things you can do. Think about that, and then go and get some advice. Yeah, and you can also express it as percentages. So, you want ten percent of your entire estate to go to a particular person. That's um, very often. Uh, there'll be your remainder clause. Yes, um, you can have all sorts of percentages, and we do. And there's no problem with that. Yes, and. Can you leave the money in your will to anybody? Because we often joke about the lost dog's home Mm. or things like that. And could you leave 100% of your estate to that? Yeah, absolutely. You could, and people do. Um, You know, um, charities, um, whether it's um, relating to, you know, the Red Cross type, you know, um, humanitarian or whether it's the RSPCA for animal type things, um, it's very common for them to be um, uh, beneficiaries. Yes, that's fine. Yeah. Well, you can do it under a will. Of course, you can't do it if you don't have a will. Yes, yes. So it's kind of your final way to express your wishes and your personality and what you want. Your voice when you've gone. Yeah. Hmm. Are there any things that fall more into the wishes category that don't necessarily have to be followed? 
Uh, yes, um, funeral is, a, is an example of that. It is my wish that I have a service of a particular don- denomination and whatever else or, you know, again, you might express a wish for guardianship at the end of the day. Um, you know, I might say, I want Kate to be the guardian of my children. Now, that's fantastic, but, you know, when I go, Kate's living in um, New York or Kate's lost capacity or Kate's Mm. lost interest. I haven't had any contact with Kate for the last... And it wouldn't be appropriate. Now, ultimately, it's the family court who'll make that decision. So I've expressed a wish and it doesn't necessarily have to be followed, but that's different to, you know, I don't want to worry people here. If you make gifts of items and money and remainder those things are your direction to be followed um, but expression of wishes are simply that it's a, it's a, it's a wish yeah because i once met someone who had tried to express a very specific wish in their will that their ashes be turned into a diamond and added into the pommel of a sword <laughs> that was gifted to the family and the lawyers were saying well you can write that yes. but uh, whether the family is actually going to turn you into a diamond <laughs> to place you in a sword is another question we do try and give effect to people's wishes but i think that would challenge us <laughs> yeah I, I mean it seemed quite a complex <laughs> yes. wish but uh, yeah. i mean the interesting heirloom to be passed down uh, yes yes <laughs> And what about making life easier? Because we can end up with assets all over the place and someone might have super and a managed fund and some investments in this account. How do you make that as easy as possible for your family so they know, okay, that's exactly the list of assets they've got? Uh, Well, when you give instructions for a will, you should try and um, set that out. Um, There's also lots of places like um, on our State Trustee's website, there's a checklist or various checklists, but one of them is to list assets over time. Um, And again, uh, if you do that periodically, you can either place that with your will or give it to someone um, that you want to share it with. But Bear in mind, you may not wish to share those things with other people, so that's that's entirely up to yeah. an individual. Um, but have a a list that is locatable at a point in time. Because this is one of the one of the real issues now, isn't it? That we all have mobile phones, tablets, computers. We store a lot of information on digital devices. Now, um, it can be just things like your, your assets, you know, your bank statements, your tax returns and the whole lot. Um, but equally, it can be photographs. It can be, um, 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 you know, your social media accounts, emails, all those sorts of things. Now, we need to know how to access those devices and, um, well, first of all, we've got to know what you've got and then how we access them. Um, Because the world's changing. I mean, we really have things now like cryptocurrencies, Mm -hmm. which is something on a computer that has value itself. I mean, we've always had things like Tats Lotto accounts or TAB accounts or, you know, um, gaming credits or whatever else have have value, but you can sort of access those a different way. But we're now starting to get assets that are actually value on the computer itself. So we need to know what device you've got. We need to know how to access it. And that's why we have now... um, Products like um, a DigiSafe is one that State Trustees has got where you can actually state what devices you got, how to access them, who you want to get certain items, mm-hmm. add items to it, um, give permissions and the like. Now, it's secure, private, encrypted, all that sort of stuff, but that's going to become more the norm. So that's one way of dealing with assets that are difficult to otherwise determine. Yeah. But the old-fashioned list is still not a bad one either. Yeah, because it's interesting how we own more and more things. Maybe a lot of my books I buy are just on the cloud and I don't own the physical books, but I might have quite an extensive collection of books. And Mm. um, as you said, cryptocurrencies, digital art, all sorts of things that people own these assets, but they don't have a physical existence. So it's thinking about how you can actually transfer them to someone. And it's going to become more so, isn't it? We're going to, Mm. you know, uh, electronic signatures are just going to become the norm for everything. Uh, We've got some use of them now but it'll become more so um and also i mean even things like blockchain isn't it where you know your transactions are going to be by these you know secure encrypted um um, transactions which multiple people can access and the like um that's all going to be stored on your computer we're going to have to have access to them to understand your financial position yeah Mm. and that's one of the interesting things about wills it still has to be a physical document Uh, the answer is yes it does um uh, 
the answer is yes. I was, and I say, so the, the only exception you've got is that there's, uh, because of COVID, there's been the ability to um, recognise some electronic signatures mm-hmm. for wills. But I just want to, again, caution people. It's got to be done in a very particular way using particular words and it's got to be authorised uh, witnesses involved in a particular order. So if you're going to go down that path, get get advice. You'd yeah, need to. definitely. You wouldn't want to accidentally not have the will be valid. Yeah, correct. Okay. Um, if we're talking about making a will now that we've thought about some of the things that would form part of the will, um, we often hear about the danger of do-it-yourself will kits that you could buy at the post office and um, a lot of people will say to speak to a lawyer and get a will written up. What is the sort of pros and cons to sort of each side? When do you need one versus the other? Sure. I mean, we have, as you said, we've got um, will kits and we've got online wills and they can be very good for appropriate circumstances, uh, guys. If you can follow instructions, if you're familiar, you know you're not fussed by technology. If it's an online will, and you've got a straightforward estate, that can be a very good option for you. And bear in mind, lots of wills are um, relatively straightforward. Yep. So, lots of cases where that can be fine. However, it really is for straightforward circumstances. If you've got Um, complex assets and you're like a business or trusts or overseas assets. If you've got a complicated family situation, like you've got a current partner but children to an earlier relationship or um, uh, (coughs) even someone who's going to be omitted because of conflict and the like, um, if you've got sort of circumstances like English is not your preferred language, if there might be capacity concerns that could be challenged, you want to do things like trust, then really a will kit or a online will is not really designed for that. That's where you should do a consultative will. In other words, go and see a professional will writer, either at a trustee company or a mm. solicitor, a solicitor who sort of specialises in, in doing wills, and there's lots of those, lots of very good ones. Um, and that way you can get direction and advice and make sure it's executed properly and stored properly and all those sorts of things. So will kits can be good. Consultative wills are the gold standard and, and still the best and preferred, I think. Yeah, especially because many of our listeners will have substantial assets over their lifetime because they're actually thinking about yeah. investing really early yeah. on. I think you may as well take that extra step to protect your assets. It's asset. not a significant charge for mm. what you're protecting. It's a bit like people when they say, I'm going to do my own conveyance. They say, well, you can. You can do once-off conveyancing. But, you know, gee, as you're buying a, a very valuable property, why wouldn't you get an expert to do it properly? The charge is not great. I think the same thing with wills. I don't think it's a significant charge for what you're trying to protect. Plus, you'll get advice. That advice will also tell you about things like powers of attorney and those mm. sorts of things as well, which you might not otherwise think about. Yeah, and that's probably something that if you're speaking to a lawyer and they go, okay, let's look at your whole situation, and they might go, well, potentially you need another document because you have children or you have medical issues or you're going away for a long period of time and someone might need to look after your affairs while you're gone. You can walk away with the comfort that you've considered everything, yeah. Yeah, awesome. Now, I know people like to know to where to avoid the pitfalls. And so are we able to talk about some of the yeah. common mistakes people make when preparing wills and potentially how we can avoid going there ourselves? Yeah, look, one of, one of the main mistakes is you get people who um, try and give away all their assets. I give my house and my bank account here and uh, my you know sofa over there or whatever it might be and try and list everything individually. Yep. And, of course, you know, 10 years down the track and half those things don't exist or you've required other assets and the like. So don't try and do that. Make sure that you you can gift specific items, don't get me wrong, but you need to have a, an effective remainder clause, a residuary clause that says, and I give the balance of my assets to whoever you want, making sure that you've considered a proper gift over clause. So if whoever you've said you want to take is no longer around, then it goes to someone else. So that's that's a big one. Um, you give no clause. Another one is having an effective executor clause. You know, I appoint A, yeah, but okay, but you know, you're 80, you know, you're, you're 94 and A's 97 and doesn't want to do it. Yeah. Um, who's an alternate? So having an effective um, executor clause. Um, 
just basic things like, you know, was it properly signed and witnessed? You know, did you try and make um, uh, amendments afterwards? Did you use different pens? Did you do things like that? And as you said before, or you go through all of the things, get a great will, and then you don't store it properly and no one can find it. So um, main things, they're the main things, really. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Because I know a lot of people will leave everything to their spouse and vice versa or they're each other's executors and then they might get into a situation where they're both in their 90s and one passes away and suddenly it becomes a bit more challenging. Yeah, or, you know, you say, I, I, give, I give it to, um, <clears throat> give all my uh, estate to my uh, my partner and, and if my partner predeceases me, you know, to my, to my children, bang. Um, the three of you are in a car accident together and you're all gone. Um what happens? Yeah. <clears throat> you know, there's lots of circumstances that can occur over time where, you, you know, you need to have thought in advance what you'd want to have happen in those sorts of circumstances. Yeah, and I guess that's the lawyers thought through all these worst case scenarios where the whole family disappears at once. Well, it so can at least prompt you on those you, yeah. things and you can decide what you want. And it might be, mm, I'll go away and think about that. Or yes, in this case, this is what I want here. Yeah. Okay, and what happens if you die without a will, which is what we're hoping none of our listeners do at the okay, end of this? So if you die without a, um, a valid will, you die intestate and your estate then is distributed according to a statutory formula. And that formula may or may not suit you, mm. okay? Um, in essence, it is partner's children and can be a combination of partners and children, grandchildren, and then it's parents, siblings or children of, of siblings, mm. aunts and uncles, children of aunts and uncles. If you get to first cousins and you haven't found anyone, it'll then go to the government. Oh, really? <clears throat> okay. Wow. But what you've got to think about is, will that suit me or not suit me? Let's just l- think of a couple of instances where it may not suit Say you're married but you're separated. Your spouse is still, she's still, he or she is still your spouse. That person is still entitled. Might be the last person in the world you want to have your yeah. estate, get your estate. You might be in a, uh, a family where you've got stepchildren and you consider them to be part of your family unit. And it's just, you know, they're, they're part and parcel of your family, but they're not of blood. They don't fit into the formula. What about the circumstance, and it's not uncommon these days for people to have a second relationship, so you've got a a current partner, but you've got children of a first relationship, and there's a division by the formula in the legislation as to how we divide that. And we had a very, very significant change in 2017 that took it from children-orientated to now partner-orientated. And if someone died today with a current partner and children first relationship and no will, the partner would get the first almost half a million dollars, something like 498000 plus interest, plus chattels, plus half the value of what's left. Very, very significant. And the children share the balance. Right. That may or may not be what you want. Okay. And the other thing is, if you die in testa, it's what you can't do. Remember we talked about a will when we said you can do gifts. It could be a gift of money or a gift of items or I want to leave it to an organisation that's been very important to me or a charity. You can't do those things mm. under the formula. You can't establish trusts. You can't determine who will look after your estate. It will be a person with the equal greatest entitlement. So you said before three siblings. Let's say three siblings are entitled. Which of those three siblings um, uh, administers your estate? They've all got an equal right. So you have a situation of uncertainty and potential for conflict and unintended outcomes, which is why we say to people, go and get a will done. Yeah, and is it more costly for the family as well in this search? Well, it can situation? be if there's if there's conflict and there's issues and there's delays and 
and the like. We also might have to consider things like genealogy inquiries to determine actually who is the entitled person. Now, okay, we know that lots of families are very confident that, oh, you know, you know, partner and three kids, but I can tell you now, state trustees deals with lots and lots of estates where um, we need to do genealogy inquiries that turn up you know, results that um, weren't always contemplated or known. To be fair, we get the cases where there's no one ready, will, and able to yeah. administer an estate and so um, family aren't necessarily known and we've got to make inquiries. Um, but, yeah, there can be um, additional costs to determine um, beneficiaries and the like. Yeah. Or, as I say, it's more like the potential for, for argument. Mm, yeah. And what about the, the situation where someone had made an attempt to create a will but it turns out it's invalid because they didn't have the witnesses done correctly? Okay. So they've written out all their wishes but that potentially that's a problem. Okay. Um, if you haven't complied with the provisions in the Wills Act as to what makes a valid will, um, then you may be able to prove a document as an informal will. However, that requires you to persuade a court that this document that you're holding was intended to be their, your final wishes, mm. okay? And nothing is assumed, so you'd have to prove capacity. You've got to get a, uh, a doctor to say the person had testamentary capacity at the time. Um, we'd look at the circumstances. What does it say? Does it look like a will? Where was it? Was it amongst uh, all of your other important possessions like certificates of title or was it just left on the coffee table? Um um, who are the people who are affected? If I prove this document, who misses out? What yeah. do they say about it? Um, if it's up to a million dollars, you can ask the registrar probates to do it if there's permission of the people affected. Otherwise, you might have to go to court before a judge of the Supreme Court. Now, we're not talking about magistrate's court or VCAT. You go to the highest court in the state um, to determine that issue, which is not inexpensive and very formal. So, yes, an informal will may be able to prove, but there's lots of hoops to jump through. So, classic example of um, informal wills are suicide notes. Okay, um, you know, um, doesn't mean you didn't have testamentary capacity just because you take your life, but you don't go and say, look, come over, you know, I'm about to take my life, I'll sign it and get it witnessed, I and mean, then you'll just have a person's wishes. Or, as you say, someone made a good attempt to do it, but they mucked it up because they only got one witness or something like that. So informal wills um, can be proved but are difficult and you'd want to go and get some advice. Yeah, definitely sounds challenging, especially for the family of the loved one to go through having to go to court. And Similarly like is um, you'll find a copy of a will, but you can't find the original will. And then you have to persuade a court that this was intended to be their last um, will, their last testamentary wishes. Um, and you'll need to call evidence to demonstrate um, it wasn't, you can't, well, what you've got to avoid is, you can't find it because they ripped it up because they wanted they didn't want it they wanted to revoke it. Mm. Um, it's overcoming the presumption of revocation, so you need to call evidence to show it was intended to be their last document. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> that sounds a bit scary getting into those situations. Oh, they're not so. easy. Yeah, people think they're easy, and they're not easy. Yeah. yeah. So definitely. Uh, it does make you think that getting legal advice and doing it right the first time yeah. and making sure it represents what you actually want is definitely worth the money. Correct, yep. What about the role of executor? We mentioned the term before, but whether you're thinking about who you're going to appoint as an executor in your will or your parents have said, hey, I'm appointing you as an executor, what do we need to know there about this? What you're going to need to know is it's a potentially challenging and time-consuming task and it's not for everybody. So we start with you'd want someone who's ready, willing and able to do it. Um, you know, ready is, you know, that you, you know, you're happy to take on the role. It's got to be someone who's available to take over the role because it doesn't, you know, Sid, you know, if I appoint Kate who's now living in New York, um, it's not appropriate to do it. And then have the skills. You've got to have certain, I think, um, su sufficient commercial skills to be able to do it. And I think if you don't mind taking a little bit of time just to talk about what, what an executor is expected to do yeah. because some things are obvious but for others it's um, – I think you need to think about it because an executor's role starts on day one when someone dies. 
Because your first, your first task is to deal with the body, to arrange a funeral, mm-hmm. cremation or a burial. You've got to work out, is there a will? What does it say? You've got to um, basically um, um, do things like um, um, secure and insure assets. What if there's a house? Who's got access to it? Who's got keys? Mm. Is it insured? Those sorts of things. But also very practical tasks. What happens if there's perishables in the fridge? What happens if there's a two dogs and a cat running around the backyard? Those sorts of things. So day one, you're doing. Then you've got to um, basically seek a grant of probate. So again, um, you've got to get a death certificate. You've got to get the original will. You've got to prepare an inventory, so you've got to know what the assets are and identify those. Mm. Um, you've got to advertise your intention to get a will and file material, an application, an affidavit, which is supporting material. Now, to be fair, very often you'll go to a trustee company or a solicitor who will help you through that obtaining the grant stage, yeah. but ultimately you're the one responsible. Then you get your grant and you've got to go and identify and locate beneficiaries. Um, you think, oh, well, it's all family, but not all wills just have family. You might not know who the beneficiaries are and you've got to locate them and find them and um, I- inform them. You've then got to start dealing with assets. You've got to um, call in the assets and, again, secure and ensure. You've got to determine what are the liabilities and make sure that they are properly paid. You'll need to deal with disputes. Now, there can be claims on the estate, but also it could be just a dispute amongst the beneficiaries. Again, just dealing with chattels. Mm, who, Chattel, who, left, who got that painting? Chattel battles can be as hard as anything else that you deal with. Yeah. Yes, the painting on the wall. But mum always promised me that. Yeah, but the yellow sticker on the back said it was to come to me. Yeah. Not everybody is suited to having to trying to resolve those sorts of disputes because they can be emotional and they can be wearing. You then need to do things like when you're dealing with assets, property. So there's real estate agents, there's um, conveyances, there's selling properties, making decisions over you know selling of the the property at a auction or however you do it. Shares, you're dealing with brokers and the like. Tax. You are responsible for tax. You've got to get your own new tax file number, but you've got to make sure that all of the outstanding tax returns to the date of death are done. If someone hasn't done tax for the last three or four years, running businesses or whatever else, that becomes your responsibility as well as the estate tax returns. Okay? And then ultimately when you finally distribute assets according to the will or laws of intestacy, you then have to account to all of the beneficiaries what you've done because you're the trustee, you're the guardian of other people's assets and money Mm. and you've got that obligation to ensure that it's properly accounted for. Lots and lots of things to do. Sounds like a full-time job. Well, I mean, but but that's not even sort of making reference to things like, you know, you've got to notify all the authorities, whether it's, you know, Centrelink or utilities or mail redirections and those sorts of things. That's not even including what if it's a really complex estate like there was a, 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 a trading business mm. and the person was the director of the business. Who's going to t- take on that role? Those sorts of things. So um, very important role and people also have to remember they are personally responsible. When you become executor, you take on the personal responsibility to properly distribute that estate according to the will and according to law. Get it wrong, they're looking at you so lots just, of pressure well okay but it, but it, people need to understand that yeah and um you know that's uh you know it, it's it's as i say it can be a um quite a it is a responsible but it can be quite a demanding role depending on the nature of the estate yeah so it's definitely something that if you're considering appointing your daughter or son as your executor you should probably talk to them about it before doing so yeah i mean some people think it's an honor and a privilege in the whole yeah. lot. Um, but sometimes they're not suited. They don't want to do it. They're not equipped to do it. Yes, make sure mm. it's the right person. And always think perhaps about, you know, that's where you might think about a trustee company, even as the alternate, you know, sort of, you know, there's someone who could mm. do it. If he doesn't want, he or she doesn't want to do it, then at least in the alternate, um, 
got a trusted company to do it. I mean, you might appoint someone today who's, um, you know, 57 years of age. That's fantastic. But you live for another 27 years. Um, they may not want to do it at that time. Can you have multiple executors to share yes. the role? Yeah, you can. Um, you can have multiple. Um, you've got to think about. You've got to think that through. Are they going to be joint? Uh, or are they going to be joint and several in terms of decision making mm. and the like? But yes, it's not uncommon to have joint. But mainly, what I'm thinking about is an executor and a substitute executor if the first person can't do it. So if the pers- first person is um, predeceased or um, not ready, willing, or able to mm. take on the role, then I appoint such and such in the alternate. Yeah. Um, I might just touch on this briefly, but what happens about contesting someone's will? Is there a few key points we need to know there? Yeah, I think so. Look, the, the, we don't have complete testamentary freedom in Victoria. There is a legislative right for people to claim against states. Now, um, in um, 2015, um, there were very significant changes to who can claim. It's probably half the amount of claims that we previously had. So if people are thinking historically, there are a lot less claims now than previously. Mm-hmm. Um, in order to bring a claim, a person needs to be an eligible claimant. I'll say something about that in a moment. They need to establish that a moral obligation was owed to them, insufficient provision was made for them, and in a number of cases, they may have to prove a degree of dependency. So that's what they would have to establish to succeed. Eligible claimants is the big change. Previously, anybody could claim against your state. When they brought in the changes, now you've got to be an eligible claimant, which will include obvious things like partners, children, stepchildren. But it excludes people like parents, siblings, nieces and nephews Mm -hmm. and the next door neighbour. So a lot of claims that we previously had seen, they're not eligible to bring claims now. But now it's a legislative right to bring a claim. Um, Courts are directed what to consider, you know, size of the estate, competing needs, um, provision made in lifetime, conduct, wishes expressed, all those sorts of things. But, um, yes, people can claim against estates and, yes, we do see them. Mm-hmm. Um, and they uh, can take um, can be expensive and take money out of the estate. Yeah. And what about, um, I just, again, touch on briefly, the difference between a power of attorney and a will? Okay. When we're talking about wills, we're talking about what happens to your assets after you've gone, when you've deceased. When we talk about powers of attorney, we're talking about in your lifetime. So during your lifetime, if you, say, lose capacity, who is going to make decisions for you? And it's very important that we think about powers of attorney as well as your will, and sometimes they get forgotten. And we have what are called enduring powers of attorney. The word enduring means continue, and it means even if you lose capacity, the document will continue to operate. And the powers of attorney can be financial or personal. Financial is, you know, collect your income, pay your debts, deal with your assets, sell your house, pay for aged care, whatever it might be. So that's your financial. Personal is more lifestyle decision making, which is things like can you stay at home if you've got to go into aged care, what's the appropriate aged care facility, who comes and visits, those sorts of things. Um, And then in respect to health, we have um, medical treatment decision makers these days, and so you appoint somebody to make those health wishes when you can't do it yourself. So in other words, um, is are you to be revived at all costs or not to be revived, whatever it is, is a person to make that decision for you. Hopefully you had the conversation with that person to let them know what your wishes are so that they can give effect to what you want to occur. But yep, powers of attorney in lifetime, very important to consider. Yeah, and I think it's just about communicating all of this so everyone's aware of if they are the power of attorney for someone, they actually know this in advance. Yes. Yeah. Yep. And just before we wrap up, um, I just wanted to talk briefly about superannuation because that doesn't always f- fit into the same yeah. document that you think you've specified everything in your will. Superannuation is a very important part of estate planning. <clears throat> 
and it's um, and the difficulty is it may or may not come to your estate. There are certain things that you can do about it. Main thing is to try and understand your particular policy. Now, some policies will allow you to do nominations, you know, and if it's a, a dependent, a, a binding nomination, some of those nominations need to be renewed every three years or periodically. So make sure you think about that and make sure that they're current. Um, but also understanding that ultimately it may be up to the fund manager to decide where the funds are going to be paid. Now, if you've got a binding nomination to a, uh, a dependent and there's no conflict or issues, then you'd be very confident that that's what's going to happen and that will obviously happen a lot of the times. But sometimes if there's uncertainty or conflict or the nomination's not current or the like, um, the, you know, the um, uh, trustee of the super fund may well pay it to the estate or you might nominate the estate to for it to be paid. But let's just say you've nominated someone else. You could still potentially consider a provision in your will where you say something like, if the funds from my super come to my estate, in other words, you've done your nomination, you actually hope it's paid directly, mm. but if the fund manager decides to pay to my estate, then I will pay my super proceeds to A, B and C. And that could be consistent with what you've done in your nomination. Yeah. But the important thing to know is super may come to your state, but it may not come to your state. So mm. you just have to be more familiar with what's yeah. in your policy. And superannuation can be your biggest or perhaps second biggest asset after your uh, house, after your property. So it's something pretty important to consider. So that's something if you go to a lawyer to discuss getting a will or everything like that, you could also talk to them about setting up a binding or non-binding nomination. Absolutely. I would expect them to ask those sorts of questions. Yeah, because I know there's been a few recent cases in the media in recent yeah. years where someone um, tried putting one nomination in their super and the fund decided to send it somewhere else yeah. and it potentially was the outcome that the family didn't think the deceased person wanted. Yes, and um, yes, you have disputes. You still have disputes um, over super. Two people can contest um, yeah. nominations and the like, so it does happen, yes. Wonderful. Well, we have covered a lot of ground today, but is there yeah. anything else you wanted to include before we wrapped up today's conversation? Oh, look, I really just want to thank you for the opportunity because part of the mandate of state trustees is basically to try and educate and inform the public and we want people to understand that they really should um, do wills and they should do powers of attorney and they should consider what might happen if they lose capacity in lifetime or um, when they ultimately uh, decease. So think about it and uh, whether you go to uh, a trustee company like State Trustees or a solicitor, make sure that you put your affairs in order. Yeah, and State Trustees has quite a few free checklists on things to think about before going to a lawyer or putting your list of assets together. So I definitely recommend checking that out yeah, as well. Yeah, there's lots of material on our website, which I hope is is helpful. Um, I mean, one of the things people sort of say, you know, why would you do a, a trustee company? And again, the point I'll make is whether you die in five years or 45 years, State trustees will be here. Whether you have a small estate or a large estate, we'll do it. Whether it's complex, straightforward, conflict, we'll do it. And we will take on the personal responsibility. And that sort of thing gives comfort to people. I mean, we'll do an end-to-end -end service. We'll be there to do the funeral, through to the grant, through to the accounting and the tax side of things and the genealogy. We'll do an end-to-end -end service and act independently. That's what people appoint a trustee company for. Sometimes beneficiaries don't see that at the end of the day. And they say, oh, this is easy and straightforward and we can all do it. You say, well, first of all, it was it was the testator's choice at a point in time having regard to all of these factors. That's what they particularly wanted. So um, we exist to ad administer estates. Um, that's what we do. And, um, yeah, so but, uh, whether you use us or a solicitor or whatever else, um, my recommendation is always receive it, you know, get a will and receive advice. And if you um, someone does pass into you know, the executor again, 
consider how complex the estate's going to be and, again, seek advice. Yeah, wonderful. And I definitely will check out the free will bank for Victorians. Yes, so yes. Uh, that could be quite handy as well. And I think it's a, been a great conversation and just reminding people the importance of having a will and making sure that in the event that you do pass away, things are as easy as possible for your loved ones. Important, yes. Yeah. Well, David, thank you so much for coming on the show today. It was great to chat. Thanks, Kate. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of the Australian Finance Podcast, where our mission is to improve the financial futures of all Australians. If you'd like to learn more, create a free account at rusk.com.au forward slash account to download free episode workbooks, bonus resources, and take our amazing free personal finance courses. You can also join our online community by following the link in the description. If you enjoyed the show, what we'd love is for you to leave us a snappy review on iTunes. And you can follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Rask Australia. Kate and I are also on both of those channels. Finally, if you have any feedback, suggestions for episodes or guests to come on the show, or you just have a question for us, shoot us an email at podcast at rask.com.au. This podcast was proudly sponsored by InvestSmart's Bootcamp for Beginner Investors. Build your investing confidence for only $49.50. Learn what it takes to be a successful investor with InvestSmart's Bootcamp for Beginners. This online course is self-paced over three months with live weekly webinars designed to help you achieve your financial goals and create wealth. To start your investing journey today, head to investsmart.com.au bootcamp or simply click the link in your podcast player.